Molesworth is a Los Angeles-based writer and curator. She recently released her own podcast, Recording Artist, which was done in conjunction with the Getty. She's the curator in residence at the Anderson Ranch Art Center. Helen and I had a conversation that included why it's a great thing when works of art make you cry, personal and institutional legacy, and where the divine or faith shows up in art. Oh, that's such a nice, generous question. Um, Well, now that my time is structured by my own interests and I don't feel like I'm in the service of an institution anymore, I find that a couple of things have happened. Um, One, a lot of the people who were asking me to write and I was turning things down because I didn't have the headspace or the time to write, I've been able to say yes to. And so I wrote an enormous number of essays in the past year. And I've always loved writing uh, because writing, of course, involves reading and lying on the sofa and going for a walk and taking a swim and thinking some more and taking a nap and then writing. So writing is a pretty involved process that requires a lot of time. Uh, so I've done a lot of that. And that's been, I think, probably the part of my new life that I have like just loved reconnecting with this older part of myself. And then the other thing that I've done that's been really fun is, like you, I sort of entered this podcast space and I find it really extraordinary. And I did a podcast series with the Getty and that was really, really interesting to try and figure out how how to tell stories about the visual without the visual present. Like that is a really interesting game to play. And then I'm also organizing two exhibitions for galleries. And that is also, it's just been really interesting to what it means to organize an exhibition independently or to to not be connected to an institution. Um, And so, yeah, so the whole process of not being connected to an institution and trying to figure out who I am as a, as a solo entity has been, I mean, at first I have to admit it was terrifying, but I'm not as terrified anymore. Now I think I've settled into something and it feels okay. So there are so many things about what you said that I'll circle back to mm-hmm. that I'm interested in, but I want to ask about that notion of being terrified mm-hmm. and it's something that I, had talked about too that you know I would periodically shift from being like like profusely excited and then have like spikes of pure terror. Um, <laughs> so you, sometimes in the course of an hour, sometimes in the course of the same cup of coffee. <laughs> the duration is undisclosed. But, yes. Um, what What do you think about? Fear. I mean, I, mm. I was really fortunate some years ago to do um, the executive education program at the Aspen Institute. Mm. And the kind of pinnacle achievement of that week or whatnot is to chart where you stand on, basically to locate your moral compass. Mm. And they had, you know, X, Y um, quadrants. And I sort of struggled with it because they were different. They came from... Uh, Locke and Hobbes and you know I, I like that but but I wanted like my own mm. paradigm um, and so my uh, my vertical axis I decided like the top of it was transcendence and the bottom of it was fear mm. and my theory was that the closer I got to transcendence the further I was from fear and the closer I was to fear the further I was from transcendence mm. so I thought really productively about that idea of fear or terror or whatnot. And I, I wonder, 
what you thought about some of these and, and you know, what you think the productive aspects of, of fear are? Yeah, it's such a, it's such an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think it's important maybe to start with what the fear is about, right? To actually really unpack that a little bit. And I think, I think it's probably different for everyone, although I, I suspect that there's probably some structural similarities, right? And then how that graphs onto your own identity or your own history. I mean, part of the fear was financial. Like, how am I going to pay my mortgage? You know, how am I going to survive? How, what is going to be my livelihood? And that's, that was a real fear. And that brought up a ton of stuff from my childhood that I didn't clearly hadn't processed, you know, clearly hadn't worked through, you know, ver- different feelings of dependency and independence, right? This is the classic, this is the dynamic of the child in relationship to her parents, right? Like, so you don't think you're behaving like that at work, but that is part of what's happening at work, right? You are dependent and you are independent and you are negotiating those things in the space of the of your workplace. Um, and one of the things that that led me to believe that, or led me to understand, was that I, I wasn't going to make as much as I had been making and that I was actually okay with that. And that was big too of like, what was I okay with not getting in return for not doing? And so I sort of started making this mental equation. So, you know, admin, HR, managing up, that equals X amount of dollars, and I don't make those dollars anymore, but I also don't do that work anymore. And that began to be a kind of almost liberating form of the mathematics. Um, The other part of the fear, I think, is more intangible, but also gets more to your point of transcendence. The word I use is liberation. I have a feeling they're probably similar structurally for us which is that when I'm out now, when I write, when I'm out at a party, when I'm doing my work, I feel like I no longer have any protective carapace. I'm Helen Molesworth. I'm not the chief curator of anything. I don't have any cover. I'm out there. I feel really, really exposed. And that exposure Still has mo- I still have moments of where that's just like pure terror. But the, the flip side of that exposure or the flip side of my just being out there with no institutional cover is now when I'm asked to do something, I really sit with it and think, is this what I want to do? Because for the last 20 years, I did a lot of stuff that I didn't want to do, but that I thought was good for the museum, good for the institution, good for the staff, good for the trustees. You know, I had a lot of other goods. And now there's the liberation. It's like, do I want to attach my name to this? And I'd never thought like that before. And I feel really fortunate. I have a lot of friends in their 30s, and I feel like... I've learned from a lot of my friends who were never institutionally affiliated, like that's how they proceed. And there's something really liberating in that because it gives you a strong sense, like you said, of your more of like, what are my ethical concerns and does this align, does this, that or the other project align with my aspirations and who I want to be in the world and what I want to put out in the world. And I... I hadn't been thinking like that. And this is a really new way of thinking. Super interesting, super interesting. So one of the things that I've been sort of practicing is how things feel physically for me, like where they sit in my body. So I don't know if you've thought about things like that. And Very much so. Cool. Mm-hmm. So when you think about that notion, which I call transcendence, your you collaboration, what does it feel like? Can you describe like the physical sensations of that? 
That's a really interesting question because I think I still might be thinking about it like in the negative, if you know what I mean. Like if so, if I if something happens and I feel my stomach mm -hmm. um, seize or I get like what I would call these like spikes of adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Like if I, you know, if I, if I feel that happen, I listen to that now in a way that I clearly had not been listening to it. I knew it was happening, um, but I thought it was something wrong in me, right? I was beating myself up, like, why can't I be cool? Why can't I stay chill? Like, why am I getting so upset? Is it hormones? Is it this? Is it that? And now, like, if I feel that adrenaline, I'm like, oh, duly noted body of Helen Molesworth to brain of Helen Molesworth. Thank you. And... I shut up and I try to think. I like, I won't override my gut anymore. And that's really interesting too. Cause that's also a fear moment. Like if, is it fear or is it that other thing in you saying, don't go there, man. You actually don't trust that person. Own it. Own that you don't trust that person. Be gracious and move on. So I do feel it really physically. And I wonder if it's, I mean, I would ask back to you, do you think it's like, because we're not in those, that like kind of nine to seven, take a break, you go feed your kids. I walk my dog, <laughs> night shift, eight o'clock dinner. <laughs> Maybe we didn't, I don't know. Could you pay attention to your body in that pace? I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to mine. I don't know. I can't look back really and tell you, mm -hmm. you know, but I can tell you where I am now. And I, I think I've learned a lot from meditating, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. And I think that has been able to, through that, I've been able to slow a lot of things down. Right. And one of the things that I've worked hard on in my life is, um, and not just recently, but you know, over time, is to insert the pause between you know, like what I think and what I say, um, or whatever. But just that that moment, right? Somehow, like the stop, um, whether it's you know, a breath or feeling myself like physically standing or sitting. Uh, but then it's often in that moment that I know what I want to do. You know, not necessarily immediately. The, the decision might be like, I don't know what I want to do yet, so I'm going to wait 24 hours. Like I, my son played as hockey, right? And there was this 20, in hockey there's a 24 hour rule. And the idea is that if someone is really upset about something like a bad call from the ref or, you know, the coach having someone play or not play or whatever, that if you're really upset about something, you had to wait 24 hours before you were allowed to bring it up. And if in 24 hours it still really bothered you, then you knew that it needed to be discussed. But a lot of things in 24 hours, you have the kind of um, grace of time and you realize that, like, you know what, they were doing the best they could in that moment, or they clearly didn't have all the information and they regretted the decision they made, or you know, whatever it is. But if it still really is hot um, and bothersome 24 hours later, then yeah, let's, let's address it. That is something I'm going to take away. <laughs> because I think I am still... I mean, I'm much slower to answer questions that come at me from the outside. But the idea that you would wait, that that would be sort of like a general operating principle mm -hmm. is so brilliant. And of course it's counter to everything I did that allowed me to do the work I did for the past 20 years, which was 24 hours. Do you know how much you can get done in 24 hours? Like, vroom, like I was always on such a, uh, I didn't know this until after I left one of the jobs I had that this, that the, the staff called me the white tornado because I would like, literally I would come in the office, like, you know, make a big thing and then leave. And that was how I got a lot of work done. I did a lot of work. I got a lot of work done, but I love that just 24 hours. 
It's not everything. It's right. just if something's really hot. Right. You know, and Bob Lagoon, who uh, unfortunately you know died mm -hmm. last year, he was a really calm and really wise man. And he said to me, I mean, years ago, I have this strategy, Peggy. You know, if someone's like really upset about something, he said, you know, I push it to the corner of my desk and I wait and see what happens. And he said, most people move on to the next thing. Right. And he said, if they don't, well, then they can come back to you. You know, he said, but I think you should try it. So, I don't know, eight years ago maybe, mm. I tried that. And again, it's not with everything, of course. You right. know, I was available right. seven right. days a week, 365 days a week, mm -hmm. 14 years. So, right. it's not about being slow. It's about stepping aside and waiting Right. sometimes. Well, it's For about... a to kind of have their own like, energy. Right, and I what I hear in it is always, I mean, I think... The biggest challenge so many of us face is our own narcissism. And it's actually about, like, because what else I hear in that story is, I don't have to solve this. I'm, I don't have to solve it right now. And I might not have to solve it. In 24 hours, time itself Correct. may solve this problem. I don't need to bring my ego into this scenario and control everything. Yeah. And I think that's a... That's a really big thing to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Many things solve themselves. Right. And uh, sometimes pushing on something for the outcome that you think you want, that I think I want, isn't the right, right way, right? Because sometimes the allowance of whoever is in control, you know, the universe or mm -hmm. God or whatever, mm -hmm. um, has a better plan. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. Time. And just trusting in it. Because it's, it's also a trust issue, right? Which it gets you that back into true. fear, right? Which is like when you're scared, when you're terrified, one of the things you're saying without really saying it out loud is, I don't trust the dynamic, the situation, the space that I'm in, right? And so you're, you, you have to figure out how, where your trust lies, who it lies in, or what forces it lies in. That's exactly right. That's the yep. word I've been thinking about. Yeah, that's a good one. 24 hour rule. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm big on things like that. Uh huh. So let's talk a little bit about writing. Okay. The way that you described it is not dissimilar to my own mm. process, mm -hmm. but somehow. It sounds like maybe you enjoy it more than I do. I know that I'm supposed to say it's really hard and that I hate it. <laughs> because it is really hard. But I've never hated it. Um, you know, I'm someone who, you know, I got a dissertation, so I wrote, you know, I got a PhD, rather, so I wrote a dissertation. So I'm someone who at some point, early, relatively early on, in fact, I think different in some ways from many of our colleagues. While you guys were like assistant curators and like humping your way up a hierarchical ladder and learning all this kind of stuff, I was sitting and writing a dissertation on Marcel Duchamp. And um, it was really lonely and it was really hard. And the writing remains lonely and hard, but I really like it. I like doing it. So let me ask you this, because I don't dislike doing it, but somehow, and I've done it a ton. You know, I know you have. But, uh, I mean, you are the most beautiful writer. Oh, and thank you. I noticed that even in your podcast, mm -hmm. when I was listening to it, I was like, I bet Helen wrote that down and then she read it because the way that you put together words is just genius. And frankly, that was an inspiration for me because mm, thank you. I try and just be present and do things in the moment. But I was like, Helen sounds way better than mine. I'm going to write it down. I, it is. It's <laughs> script. It's scripted. <laughs> it's scripted. Definitely. It's yeah. so good. It's so good. So anyway, 
every time that I write, I think I'm never going to be able to do it again. And every time I finish, I'm so surprised and proud. Do you have that? Of course. I think that's classic. I mean, I say I'm going to uh, write something. Like, you asked me to write for your last, you know, I think it's your last show, right? Yes, it's the uh, Lisey Scavage. It's coming up. Yeah. And I, I have, first off, I mean, I have to say, I never really know what I think until I write. So that's also part of it. Like, I'm, I'm the master of saying the wrong thing. Um, so for me, writing is like a really useful exercise because not only does it protect me from this bad habit of mine, but it also lets me figure out what I think. But I sat down, you know, to write about Lisa and I thought what I often think, oh shit, I should just call right now and say I'm really sorry while they still have time to get somebody else. Like I pretty much say that at the beginning of almost every essay. Uh... Just so you know, that makes me feel better. Oh, my God. <laughs> totally. Totally. And because there is, you know, one of the reasons I think we're interested, I mean, it's this profound dilemma. One of the reasons I assume people are like us are interested in pictures is because pictures condense an enormous amount of information. And so they're nonlinear. And then you have to, then you do this totally perverse thing where you're like, actually, I'm going to uncondense all of the information and make it linear. So you like undo the thing that you love. Like, why would you do that? And yet somehow that does bring you so much closer to the object of study, but also to oneself, right? You really learn like the contours of your own mind and... Um, and, and this year in particular, I wrote a lot and it's very quote unquote personal. Like I'm, I use the first person. I talk about my childhood. I talk about things. I really am trying to figure out like, why am I interested in Lisa Scovich? Why have I been interested in that body of work for 20 years, but have been too embarrassed to do anything about it. And so this was the opportunity to like really unpack that, you know, and, I found myself like going over memories from my childhood that I hadn't thought about. And that's profound for me. So like, yeah, I I really don't know. It's it's hard to talk about writing sometimes, but it is a, it, so much of it feels quote unquote selfish. Like it's a way I figure out who I am in relationship to things. So can you describe for our listeners a Lisa Scavage painting that you can call to mind? Sure. Well, that's quote unquote easy because I've been writing about a painting called Northview, um, which is from 2000. And in it, uh, a young female woman, girl, child, girl, child, woman. It's very hard in Lisa's pictures to know how old people are. Um, cause they have very voluptuous, she has a very voluptuous body, but a childlike face. And she's standing in profile. She's backlit by a window where a large drape has been pulled to the side. Next to the drape is a bookshelf. Behind her is a wall where we see an unarticulated painting, but we know it's fancy cause it's in a gilt frame. She's standing in this room. She's in between a desk and a chair. She has very long, beautiful fingers that are touching the desk. And they are draw our attention to a small statuette of a monkey that's on the table. She is in, I mean, she's basically nude slash naked. There's a scarf that kind of falls off her in the most seductive way and a strand of pearls is around her neck, but it hangs down off her back like a kind of plumb line to accentuate her extremely gorgeous and like hyper-sexualized ass. The whole thing is like the color of honey and amber. Um, Everything is soft. She's got that kind of perfect brown skin. I mean, she's a white woman with that sort of perfect tawny brown skin with the pink undertones. Um, And she has blonde, curly, tendril-like hair. It's a ridiculous picture. (laughs) 
Such a good description. <laughs> so, after that description, I almost feel like I don't need to ask you this question, but why do you love art? Oh, God. Why do I love art? <sighs> Again, I mean, it's a, it's akin to the writing. Like, I think the world is an incredibly complex place. And I'm not saying that language isn't complex. Language is absolutely complex. But we behave like it isn't. And so we lean on it. And we pretend we're communicating with one another. And it's entirely unclear how well we are or not. And there's something about pictures and the way they condense things the way they condense feeling and time and space and the agency of the person who makes it and the agency of the person who looks at it uh, that I have always responded to incredibly viscerally. Um, I love art because I love artists. Uh, they're the last people in the world, I think, who get to say no with impunity. I love, um, I love the ethics of being an artist. Uh, I love art because it's the closest thing I have to helping me understand, um, you know, love and freedom. These are the big ideas that art traffics in for me. And it more than, re it doesn't represent those things for me, it enacts them. It is them. It is them. It is them. It's not a picture of love. It is love. It's not a picture of freedom. It is freedom. And I have always been very interested in being near, near the, those things, those objects and those images that perform that work. Yeah. Thank you. I agree with you. And, Damn. Uh, I think that is like the essence of what I hope to do now is to share that truth with more people. Mm -hmm. Because once you know it, once you can even get like a whiff of it, right? It's seductive. Totally. And it is all powerful and all consuming and all optimism and hope and possibility. It's everything. It's everything. And it's also, it's, it's all those things partly also because it's time travel. Like I think you know when you look at something from the ancient period that it's coming to you from, uh, it's coming to you from another time. That's extraordinary. And you know when you look at something made yesterday, especially if you're a museum person and you're thinking about acquiring it for your institution, you're not thinking about acquiring it for your institution for like right now. You're thinking about whether or not that object can withstand the time travel of the next one, two, or three centuries, right? I mean, Manet's Olympia has withstood the time travel. Uh, that's extraordinary, right? So that's, that's another thing it's doing. That's another reason I love it. I'd love to be able to go into the future and go back in time. Art is the closest thing I've got to that. Do you think, do you think the capacity to project forward and to make decisions now that you won't ever see come to fruition, um, does that drive your work? Do you think that's a broad-based skill? God, I don't know. I've grown increasingly comfortable in myself, perhaps not being totally public yet about it. 
with um, understanding the relationship between those of us who work in and around culture uh, and understanding what culture's relationship is to faith. Uh, Because it seems to me the structure of belief we have around art, like the structure of belief I just enumerated to you and that you're questioning me back about, is about whether or not I have some faith, ultimately, that some of the choices I've made or enterprises I've engaged in have a life beyond me, have a life beyond this life, have a life beyond this time. And, you know, like, whatever. I mean, these are the mysteries of faith. Like, I, I can't know, but... I've staked an ethics on it, and I'm interested in talking about maybe what that might mean, Um, even though it makes me feel like a little anxious to talk about it publicly, because what does that mean? And, you know, I'm supposed to be this, like, you know, theoretical intellectual who, who doesn't have those sorts of thoughts. But, you know... Art and structures of faith have been partners since probably the beginning. And the div- their divorce is a relatively recent one. And, you know, I'm a romantic, so I'm assuming they will get remarried, just like Liz and Richard, you know, like, <laughs> like you know, they will, they will, like, we have to have those conversations, I think, about what we're talking about when we're talking about saving something for the future. Like, what does that mean? Part of it is that I have faith that the future will come, that this museum will still stand, and that something that we did now will mean something to someone 100 years from now, someone I can't imagine. And I believe in that because I know when I stand in front of the girl at the bar at the Folie Bergère in the Courtauld in London, I'm in tears when I go to... Vienna and walk through the Kunsthistorisches, I'm in tears. And I'm in tears because I understand that something profound is happening, that there's some kind of really profound form of communication is happening. And I believe in that. And so I have to believe in it moving forward as well. and I think these times are trying times, and they have certainly tested my my faith has been tested. And there have been days I didn't believe, because I'm a human being. And when your faith is tested, there are days you don't believe. And then you reassemble your belief, because without it, what? then there's just cynicism, which I refuse. Uh. This spring, I took my kids to the Art Institute in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they had been there, of course, before. But I took them specifically because I wanted to show them the paperweight collection there. Mm -hmm. Um, Because that is a defining moment for me. I don't know if you know the story about it. I don't. When did you see it? How old were you? Well, so my grandmother was a collector. Uh And she decided that I would collect paperweights. Um, so when I was a kid, instead of a dress or a doll, I would be given a paperweight. And I never cared about them because I wanted a dress or a doll. Uh, until I was a junior in college and my mom was dating a guy who's now my stepfather. And he lived in Chicago. And so for Christmas break, we went to Chicago and I went to the Art Institute. Uh, and I had never been there because I'd never been to Chicago. And I saw the paperweight collection, and I saw things that I owned. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, I have that, and I have that, and I have that. And I was always interested in museums, and I, it was just this really eye-opening moment for me. Uh, because it, I don't know, somehow made me think that museums were a viable profession for me. The art world was like something viable. I thought I would go to law school and be a lawyer. And it was there that I decided that I was going to tell my parents that I wasn't taking the FSATs and that I wanted to try and, you know, 
quote unquote, make it in the art world. Oh, wow. And so I took my kids because I wanted them to see those objects, which are familiar to them because they right. sat on my desk really since that day. Um, but the reason I'm telling you this story is because after we looked at the paperweights, which by the way, they were like, whatever, um, we you know started walking through the modern and contemporary galleries. And in the modern galleries, I stopped in front of this go painting hugely problematic for tons of mm-hmm. reasons. Um, and the reason I'm sharing it is because for whatever reason, standing in front of it, I was moved to tears. Right. I cannot tell you why. I can only tell you that it happened. And the experience of uh, being moved to tears in front of works of art has happened to me more than once right. in my life. I would hope so. <laughs> I would imagine so. Right, yeah. but not a thousand times. Right, you know? right. Mm-hmm. So uh, it is not a daily occurrence, Right. but it's something that when it happens, it somehow feeds my soul at the right. deepest level. And part of what I am so like, profoundly attracted to about it is that it is not prescribed. Right. I can't do it on command. Um, I don't know how to make it happen. It just sometimes happens. Yeah. And watching my son in particular notice that I was crying because I was standing in front of this painting was also a really interesting experience mm-hmm. because my kids have grown up around art um, and they like it, you know, right. like I do, right. uh, but they haven't had that experience. Oh, that's so interesting. I wonder what, I mean, I wonder um, how to talk about those tears, right? Like how to talk about that wellspring of emotion that does, as you so rightly say, overcome one. It, it can't be performed. I mean, if it's performed, then it's just, then it's, then it's horrible, right? If like, for it, you can't find yeah, if you're looking for it, you can't find it. Like it does, it, it, it literally does overcome you. And I, um, how, how could, how, what is the way that we can talk about that? Not to explain it away, but to understand just a little bit more the texture of, um, where you're able in that moment to be vulnerable. Cause I see it as a form of vulnerability, right? Like it's a form of vulnerability to the other and the other in that moment is really complicated because the other is the picture, the other is Gauguin, the other is the people in the picture, the other is everything you know, as you said, that is just so, so problematic. The, the other is sometimes I think also yourself to yourself. Like when you see something that you remember from a long time ago and now you see it again and it, it unmoors you from where you are, uh, like that, it's just such a complicated scenario and and it's also can be really confusing i mean when the carrie james marshall exhibition was on view in los angeles i went to the galleries a lot and because i because something was happening right i mean the galleries were always packed and and i almost always saw uh someone crying in front of a painting it was you know It was typically an African-American woman standing in front of a painting crying. Um, And I was just really aware of like, wow, this shit is so powerful. Because this woman is not standing in front of this painting crying about necessarily this painting. This painting is to use like the contemporary language, you know, is triggering. But maybe it's not triggering. Maybe it's enabling Maybe it means not trigger in a negative sense. Like maybe, maybe that work was enabling a certain kind of like repair. You know, that's the other thing that I think is happening. Like works of art can be kind of reparative. Like the world is a horrible, cruel, unfair, violent, vicious place. And sometimes art is doing the work of mending some of those small tears and large tears, you know? I love that, you know, and I 
also saw the Carrie James Marshall show yeah. in LA. And I also noticed uh, more than one uh, circumstances where people were crying in front of yeah. paintings. And I never shared that with anyone. Um, but the fact that you brought that up reminded me that I had that experience. And it was so interesting because, and I want to get back to what you were talking about in a second, but separate from that, I felt um, uncomfortable, like almost voyeuristic, viewing the show while other people were having those experiences. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I love the show and I love yeah, yeah. work and, and um, that didn't happen to be my experience that day, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Potentially it could sure. or, or whatever. Um, but that is really interesting too because the idea when you're moved by works of art, you're in a space usually with other people. Right? I mean, we've had the benefit, of course, of being in these things with our clothes right. and seeing things by ourselves or with just one friend or whatever. But, you know, the day that I'm describing when I was in the Art Institute and the day that I'm describing when I was in MoCA and the days that you're describing, I mean, those are public days. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are a lot of other people around. Yep. Um, and the fact that there's that um, openness, I guess, of that experience. I think is also somehow something woven into the fabric of, of why these experiences are important, you know, and I, I like to try and give examples that are non-art examples for like non-art people, right? Mm -hmm. So well, what are other times that you have been overwhelmed by emotion? Um, is it a smell that reminds mm -hmm. you of something that your grandmother used to cook? You know, or is it um, hiking to the top of a mountain and you know remembering a friend who's died? Mm -hmm. Or you know, like what, like what are these moments? And if one, whomever, um, can identify with that uh, feeling of maybe it's the divine, mm -hmm. uh, you know, then is there an open-heartedness to other potentially related? opportunities right which looking at art we know can be right it's really interesting I mean I've often like I actually think museums are really queer <laughs> like I know everybody thinks they're white heterosexual male colonialist spaces and they are but they're also I think really queer spaces, both in terms of like queer as in odd, but queer as in a certain kind of, you know, um, non-conventional way of thinking about desire. And one of the reasons they're queer is because I think we go to museums to have private experiences in public spaces. And like, that's not kind of quote unquote normal, right? So... The other places we do that, in my mind, are the cinema and church, right. right? And in the cinema, there's like that history of catharsis. And so you kind of, you kind of go knowing it's going to be a weeper. And like That's you right. almost kind of want it, right? Well, you're in the dark. You're in so the dark. You're so you're kind of private, yeah. right? And I think... You know, maybe the, maybe church doesn't function for most of us that way anymore. Um, I mean, I haven't gone to church or cried in church in a very long time. Um, but I have sat in, you know, churches alone and, you know, wept like a baby, like I'm sure many people do. Uh, but I do think there's something about the museum, you know, one of the things I was really aware of with, you know, we could just use Carrie's show as a kind of easy example. Because those paintings are figurative, even when those galleries were empty, they were filled with people. And I think museums are spooky like that too. That's another way they're queer. Like they're actually filled with people. There's the viewers and then there are all the people in the pictures and then there are all the people who made the pictures. And so there's like a lot of ghosts. There's a lot of people, a lot of spirit energy in those spaces. And I think 
this desire, I, almost, I don't know quite how to say it, but I think there are some things we can do and say in public that in fact are harder to do alone. You know, um, maybe, maybe that moment of crying in front of a work of art, like, I mean, when I cry in front of the girl at the bar at the Folie Berger, I cry in front of that painting, not only because of that painting, not only because I miss my grandmother who taught me how to work, I cry about it because I think Tim Clark is a genius and he opened up that picture for me. I cry because work is lonely and shit is hard and I'm tired of being a woman and I'm tired of withstanding those pressures. And if I do that at home alone, that's almost scarier. Do you know what I mean? Like at least in the, yeah. at least on that bench in the court hold, I know I can pull it together and I'll be fine. But if like, if those tears happen in the shower at home, you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, it can, it can go on forever. How do you stop it? Okay, so in the museum in front of the painting, they're about all those other things that you said, but they're really about the painting. Right. right. And in the shower at home, they're really about uh, you. Right. Right. So, I mean, that's another way, right, that works of art that are so generous because, uh, and, and I love that idea of, because I always talk about works of art having energy, mm -hmm. you know, of course, the aura of the art object and whatever, but, but I talk to people about how you can feel it. You can feel the energy of these objects. Um, but I haven't necessarily thought about it in the terms of like the spirits of the people. I mean, I think a lot about the people that made things and like the decorative arts, like the people that used them. Mm -hmm. Like that's always obsessed mm -hmm. with me. You mm -hmm. know, since I'm a kid, I'm like, who used this bowl? Where did it sit? Who cleaned it? Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I, I loved art always, you know. Um, but the idea of and I, and I think about the objects when no one else is around and how they talk to each other and, you know, whatever that means. Uh, but I'm really interested in that idea of, like, the cacophony of voices, right, of, of all those different spirits. It can be so loud sometimes in all that quietness. So loud. Um, when I was in graduate school, I read... Um, I think, what's it called? Durkheim's, you know, Sociology of Religion or some, something like that. And he talks about mana and mana being, you know, like when the things have energy, they have the energy of everyone who's made them, everyone who's touched them, everyone who's moved them around. Like that's, a, you know, and we clean all that up. Like we make it into provenance and we have the registrars put on their white gloves. And like, we, we're like, museums really try to, strip the mana, make it a kind of antiseptic situation around the mana. But I think it's really there. And I think those of us who've been privileged enough, like, you know, to work really closely, really intimately with every aspect of how an object is moved, when it's placed, where it's, when it comes down, when they break, when they, when they come out of the crate and they refuse to play with anything else in the room. And you're like, wow, you are completely ruining my install plan. Like, cause you just are cantankerous. You won't play with others, you know, like we know those things are real. And, and I, I think we may have done a little too much cleaning up of that messiness um, in this hyper financially fueled world that wants these things to behave as financial instruments or markers of taste and affluence, but they're 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 crazy complicated these objects and um, I I don't know maybe it's part of this new time right of not not having to, it's like, I don't work in a hospital anymore. So like, I don't have to wear the scrubs, you know, like I can actually talk about actually that stuff is powerful in there. And, um, I'm not prepared to write off those powers anymore. Yeah. So, um, some of the things that we've been talking about are like pretty esoteric, right? mm. uh, references, to, references to God or the divine right. or references to you know, mana, spurious energy. Right. Um, what do you tell someone 
who's never looked at art? Like, how do they start? Well, and I'm not talking about like living with art or collecting or anything like that. It's like, you know, it's like someone who wants to enter a space where there is art. Um, like, what do you need to know? Well, I mean, there are, they're all different things that I've said to people over the years. Um, I mean, first off, you know, museums are public for a reason. We imagine that we hold, right? Museums imagine that they hold collections in the public trust. And so I try to make it really, really clear that they're for you. Everyone's they're for you. And if there's some idiot at the door making you feel uncomfortable, walk, walk around them. Right. Walk around them. That's good advice in general, right? Yep. If someone's making you uncomfortable or you think that they're trying to block your access. Don't turn around. Walk around them, right? Uh, and then the other thing I say, and I say this to people at all quote-unquote levels, I say it's okay to be really dumb in front of an art object. And you can ask an art object, the, there is no dumb question. So what are you made of? Where are you from? Why are you here? What do you do? Who are you? Like these are, ba these are dumb questions, but in the answer to those questions, which kind of everyone knows, those are the five W's, like that's like second grade. Right? How do you read the news? Who, what, where, when, and why? Right? The why being the hardest always. Um, the answer to those questions, I'm made of wood. Oh, okay. That's a lot of information. That's an enormous amount of information. I was made in 1800 in England. Huge piece of information. Huge. I was made by a white man. Um, you know, I, I, like all of those things add up. So this, the, to be dumb is okay. Like that, that's always what I say. Because everyone feels dumb. So you might as well just own it. Yeah, sure. Be dumb. Something nonverbal is trying to communicate with you in a nonverbal way. That's like the meaning of dumb. <laughs> right? That's the meaning of m mute. So it's okay to just be basic. And from that basicness will come everything. Yeah. I love that. And I, I very much love the idea of, you know, the Buddhist notion of beginner's mind, right? Like, just start again. Right? Like, there's no, there's no marker. Right? Just, yeah, just start. Just start. Just do one thing. Look at one thing. Five right. minutes. Yeah. Right? Maybe next time you look at two things and you spend six minutes. You know, whatever. So. And I also, I also sometimes tell people it's a game. If you don't know basketball, you watch it, you don't know what the hell's going on. It's a game, it has rules. It has players, it has outcomes, it has hierarchies, it has failures, it has successes. It's a game. Be curious. It's okay. Like, you can like it or not like it. You can understand it and not like it. You can understand it and love it. You can not understand it and love it. Like, all of those things are available, you know? Um, I mean, the art world has done art a great disservice. <laughs> you know, I mean, we really, we really have. We really created, like us. I mean, talk about smoke and mirrors, man. You know, like just crazy. You know, it's 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 stupid. It's stupid. I remember when I was leaving Berkeley to go to Aspen, and there was a party to you know celebrate my achievements and my future and uh, and some of the trustees there who were my friends gave me this big shovel. And um, they said, this is, you know, so that you can shovel like the snow when you're going, but it's also because you're really good at, you know, 
shoveling that. <laughs> Shovel some downpour. Yep. And um, and that's both true and not true, right? Mm -hmm. um, all these things. You right. Know, everyone has the opportunity to share what they see. Absolutely. And like anything else, like any form of expertise, you know, um, the more you know, the more interesting the thing will be. That's right. Just, just, I mean, that's true. That's not only about art. That's about everything. The more you know, the better you'll be at it. The more you know, the more you'll see. The more you know, the more complex it gets. The more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. It's really, I think, about curiosity, which is back to vulnerability. Because I think to be curious is also in a way to be vulnerable, you know, to, uh, to be open to the world, right? To, to know that there are things you don't know and to be interested in learning about them is uh, a form of vulnerability. So someone shared with me this week that there's an opportunity to love something or someone enough to be okay with having your heart broken. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so approaching whatever, whoever, uh, with that open-heartedness, knowing that the possibility of having your heart broken exists, yeah. somehow, potentially makes all of the experiences that much more beautiful. That, I hate to say it, is really true. <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely got my heart broken recently. And... Uh, And one of the things it did was sort of, I don't know, ironically or not, I don't know if it's, I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, it made me really aware it could happen again. And it made me really aware that the game I wasn't good at, which is the game of politics, um, is a game of protection. That the people who are really political don't get their hearts broken. I'm going to ask you a different question. Knowing what you know and having experienced that heartbreak, was it worth it? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, without question. Never. I mean, I wouldn't... I wouldn't do anything... I wouldn't do very much differently. I, yeah. I mean, they're like one or two things that are pretty technical that I would have done differently, but would I have done any, any of it differently? No. And I won't really do that much differently moving forward either. I'm still going to be interested in what I'm interested in and perhaps even more recklessly say what I believe. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to talk so honestly. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks. Conversations about art is part of Art. This episode was produced by Simon Illa. Our theme music was composed by Eric McDougall. Jordan Weisberg is our curatorial associate. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review us on whichever platform you listened, as it will help us further our goal of connecting all to art. <laughs>